Now, while America had created the atomic bomb, um, they weren't the only ones by the late 1940s doing that, and that is going to influence our own policies. The Soviets test their own bomb in September of 1949, so they have caught up to us fairly quickly. And with this, the National Security Council issues sort of uh, statement number 68 in 1950. And this is clearly about the Soviet Union. In NSC 68, it says that the Soviet Union is trying to exert its absolute authority over the rest of the world. We see this as a threat to our national security. So what the NSC sort of says in NSC 68 is the way that we are going to fight this new type of war, yes, is with weapons, but it is with information. And so we have sort of the grand era of Cold War spies. Also with NSC 68, it's estimated that this process will take about $50 billion. So we know this is not going to be fast. It's not going to be cheap. But this is now how wars will be fought. We're going to be talking about conflicts within the Cold War. It's called a Cold War because Russia and America never directly fight. But their friends fight. This isn't a, an entirely peaceful era. Last time we checked in with China was sort of during the imperialism unit, the very beginning of this semester, where China had uh, negated or they never had modernized and kept thinking that they could compete against the West. Well, it didn't work. We saw it with the opium wars and the unequal treaties. And then with the Boxer Rebellion, that once again, even in 1899, China thinks that they can defeat the West and they just can't because they have not developed technologically. Even though Britain and many other Western countries had influence and control in China. China still had its own government. It had an empire. That empire comes to an end in 1912. The, the government ceases to exist, so they have a chance to do something new, to try a new system. So these two guys, Sun Yat-sen and Chiang Kai-shek, they, um, well, they were sort of upper class Chinese men. They had been educated in America, and they see this as an opportunity to establish democracy in China for the first time. Now, China has a huge population, and these were two guys who happened to benefit directly from imperial control. They had seen democracy work in America, so they try and establish that in China in the 20s and 30s. If China had been completely left alone to do its own thing, perhaps it could have succeeded. But that, ne that never happens. We don't exist in a vacuum. During the 1930s, remember Japan's aggression that they wanted to develop their sphere of influence in the region? That included the Korean Peninsula and China, specifically the area of Manchuria and Nanking. In the late 30s, when the Japanese were taking over. They take over this uh, this territory. It's very rich agriculturally. Japan has very poor uh, farmland, doesn't have much farmland. And it's just, it's called the Rape of Nanking because it is so, so damaging. They kill Chinese civilians. They put them in these prison camps, just absolutely vicious. When Japan loses World War II, they back out, but it leaves China in chaos. China is once again left wondering, why were we taken over? Why can't we fight back? That whatever we're doing is not working. Our empire didn't work. This new democracy isn't working. And so the civil war, China against China, happens after Japan sort of vacates and leaves a power vacuum. If you think of how large China is, how large the population is, it would make sense that a political system not based on um, you know, the people who are wealthy, who are educated, like Sun Yat-sen and Chiang Kai-shek, but that everyone would benefit, the communism becomes very popular. When you have a large population of very, very poor people, a very small group of rich people, the idea that communism and creating more equality is incredibly attractive. So in the civil war that results in the late 1940s, the Communist Party gets more and more power, and eventually they will take over. And their leader is Mao Zedong, sometimes spelled Z-E-D-O-N-G, Zedong or Zedong, same thing. He now takes over and China becomes communist in 1945.
1949. We are seeing increasing Soviet control in the Far East. Now, the Korean Peninsula had been under Japanese control at the end of the war, though. It goes to Soviet control. And there had been two political systems existing on the peninsula, one that was backed by the Chinese and therefore the Soviet Union, and one that was more democratic in nature. Problems break out between these two systems, and so we decide to intervene. Now, if we're really looking at the facts of this, America stuck its nose in where it didn't need to. And so the United Nations is able to pass a resolution that says, oh, well, actually, the United States was engaging in, quote, police action on behalf of the United Nations. So technically, this is a war between the United Nations just to keep the peace, but it really is about containment, preventing the spread of communism. This war takes place between 1950 and 1953. And at first, the American efforts are led by General MacArthur. He believed that the way to end this war quickly would be to use the atomic bomb against the Chinese. While that would be very effective in ending this war, it would also create more conflict with the Russians. Ultimately, MacArthur is fired. He is a bit too extreme. And while this war is pretty cruel, there's a lot of back and forth. At one point, the pro-communists, the, the backed by the Chinese forces, have most of the peninsula. At one point, the um, pro-democracy forces have more, most of the peninsula. And by 1953, they just sort of have to agree to disagree. And there is stalemate. And they decide to split the country essentially in half along what it, the 38th parallel. And this is known as the demilitarized zone. We watched several videos about this in class. And I showed you this picture, which is my favorite, because it really shows in a modern sense what has become the difference between these two places. <laughs> 